Welcome to the Sydney Film Festival Virtual Edition and the Documentary Australia Foundation Award for Best Australian Documentary Competition. And the film you've just seen, The Skin of Others, is one of the 10 finalists in the competition. And we're going to be announcing the winner on the 18th of June. And here to talk about the film is the director, Tom Murray. Hi, Hi there, Tom. nice to be with you. This is a film that's been a long time in the making, 10 years, I believe. Can you talk about how it actually started and uh, why, why so long? Well, at the very beginning, I was keen to make a film that uh, would talk a little bit about the experience of Aboriginal people in the First World War, because I knew that uh, there was going to be a lot of commemorations with about the First World War and mm -hmm. that probably, you know, the stories of Aboriginal people, along with stories of women, for example, would probably would not be part of that kind of national narrative. And I thought it was going to be an important story to tell. So um, thinking that I was giving myself more than enough time for your five years to, uh, before the um, centenary commemoration, 2014, 2015, I uh, set off to make, to make this film, but it, uh, it took a few more years than that. And there's a lot of research, I mean, an extraordinary amount of research from amazing archival footage, I have to say. Um, how did you approach that? Did, did you hunt far and wide? Um, where did you find most of it? Were there things you couldn't find? There was lots of, there was things I couldn't find for sure, but I did find a lot of things. So um, one of the, I, I first read about this, this story uh, uh, in an a amazing kind of biography of another Aboriginal soldier of the Second World War. But in there, it just had this little snippet about this soldier called Douglas Grant, who had been captured by the Germans, was in a German prison war camp where he was studied. And um, I thought that is a really amazing story. How great would it be in, in looking at a, a story a hundred years later, a centenary story, if I can get the voice of that soldier, if I can get some kind of images of that soldier. So I went to to Berlin where uh, there was uh, an archive there and looked around to try to find some evidence of, of this man, Douglas Grant, to find out if there would be a story in it. And I mean, thankfully I found some images that are in the film and uh, I really wanted to find some audio to hear his voice, but uh, that, was the, that was the bit that escaped me. I couldn't find any audio of, of Douglas Grant in the archive, but I looked far and wide and as you'll see know from having seen the film um throughout germany lots of places in germany and in the uk um you know this story took me quite around the world and at what point did belang tom e lewis come on board the project um i've been talking to him from about 2015 uh to be in in the, in the film and he loved the story. He absolutely loved the story. So it was really about trying to get uh, enough funds to to make the kind of biopic that we're after. And mm -hmm. um, and now filmmaking and funding is such a kind of piecemeal patchwork quilt of a process. Um, we were getting bits and pieces of money in, and uh, so we were kind of filming uh, bits and and making bits. And first of all, we decided to to make a radio program. So we made a a radio documentary for ABC Radio National as the kind of uh, prototype, in a way, for this film. And, and, and Douglas Grant's such an amazing figure. I mean, extraordinary inspirational figure. Why do you think he's been so forgotten to history? It's a really, really interesting question. Uh, I don't know. I think that, that a lot of people who, um, Aboriginal people uh, in particular, uh, have been overlooked in history. Now, why he why he has, uh, I don't know. He was incredibly famous in his day, as you get uh, an impression of in the film. Mm -hmm. um, uh, David Uniapen and Douglas Grant were often in the press in the 1920s, very famous people. So it's curious why he kind of fell off the radar. But everyone that uh, I've spoken to, including, of course, Balang and... and uh, and Archie Roach, who's in the film, Uncle Archie. I mean, they were like, why didn't I know about this guy? He's incredible. And uh, as John Maynard, the, the great historian, says in the film, you know, he's an inspiration to kind of generations of Aboriginal people. So it's really fantastic to have his story kind of come back into the, into the public through the film. And, and it's, it's such, a, it's an obviously an Australian story, but it's also a global story. 
very much a Sydney story. I mean, as a Sydney cider, as soon as I saw the film, I had to race down to Callum Park and find the Harbour Bridge, which <laughs> I found, I'm pleased to say. But also those echoes, uh, you know, he, he went to school in Annandale and Lithgow. W- was he even commemorated anywhere in New South Wales or in Sydney? Are there any echoes of that? Um, not up until recently, but there's been about three or four years ago, there was a park in Annandale that was named after him. Um, and uh, as you you know, um, the, the Harbour Ridge is still there in Callan Park, but uh, there is no kind of plaque about it, really, and there's no kind of acknowledgement of Douglas Grant's role in that. So maybe these things will change, I hope, <laughs> as a yeah, response. I'm looking for it. It's just at the back of the sports ground if you're going around the bay round, the back of the sports ground if you want to find it. Um, after Belang Tommy Lewis's passing, how did the film and its structure change? Well, we had a big idea of doing this, uh, you know, biographical documentary that uh, sort of partly fictionalised, but uh, kind of speculative documentary in some parts. Um, and we had an idea of doing maybe two, maybe three um, kind of shooting periods to, to be able to get that finished. And unfortunately, we only got one of them finished. So, um, yeah, the film really had to change after that. And as I say in the film, I I just had to set it aside for six months because I could not think of how I could possibly make it. And I also felt, you know, and to to talk a little bit about the metaphor of the bridge, which is in in the film, I I also felt, felt, although Balang was saying to me all through the process, you've got to come on the bridge with me, you've got to be on the bridge with me, and he was meaning that in all sorts of kind of metaphorical and also literal ways, um, I was I was really frightened to, to I've never been in any of my films really, so it was a, it was a um, nerve-wracking process to, to kind of put myself there. And a very emotional one, I guess. That uh, after Balang's passing, and he's, I know we've had him as a guest at the festival several times, this extraordinary larger than life erudite figure, um, uh, and we, we much miss him, it's certainly in filmmaking. And were, were there, um, uh, you know, you brought on editors and animator, other people came on board, I believe, after in the, when the, the second stage of the film, as, as, you, as I see it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, we'd always imagined that the film would have a, an animated element. We shot it all, we're shooting it all on green screens and we were looking at, um, you know, animating a lot of those sequences. I love the idea of like uh, like literally drawing from history, you know, you, you kind of extract from, from the kind of archive, from the records, and then you extrapolate from that. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so animation gives you a kind of freedom to be doing that and... Um, it's also it's a very expressive medium and very plastic and um, you know Balang and I had a lot of fun with thinking how we would kind of flesh out a lot of those backgrounds and so on so there was always the idea of of animating a lot of it but uh, once we lost Balang then um, yeah that that whole yeah we had to do a lot more thinking about what we had what we didn't have and it became a film of fragments so um, you know, you're going back through all of this material that uh, at the time didn't seem particularly significant. Mm-hmm. Um, but we all know that in our lives, that there could be something that, you know, is in our past that, that kind of then comes up again and it has a whole new meaning. And and that was the case going through all of this audio because I'd recorded so many hours of audio, like for the radio program and then just, just mucking around and we spent a lot of time in placing, placing Catherine um, just flicking ideas back and forth. So I went back through all of those tapes and a lot of that made it into the film. Were there stories uh, about Douglas Grant that you didn't make it into the film that you wished you could have squeezed in? Yeah, there was. There was. Uh, I mean, Balang was really keen for the kind of love story. So mm-hmm. um, that was one thing that we're going to film. And, uh, you know, the the idea that, uh, and there's, there's records about this, that... Uh, that uh, Balang had a, uh, I mean, that uh, Douglas Grant had a, uh, a love in the 20s and that kind of was broken apart because um, the parents of this woman, um, you know, didn't want to have a, any black grandkids, I think was 
the term. And uh, so this sequence of, of, of this lover and, and Douglas Grant was something we're going to film. And, and, and also Douglas Grant, and it would have been a wonderful kind of um, uh, medium for part of the film. He had this radio show in Lithgow uh, on 2LT Lithgow and he just recounted his life. So what a great device to be able to tell a, tell a film, you know. So we're going to, a big part of the film in that version was going to be Balang in a radio studio kind of telling stories about his life. So um, to, to kind of recount that. Imagine uh, uh, an Aboriginal man in the 1940s, mm -hmm. uh, Douglas Grant, being on a major radio syndicated radio network. He was apparently heard in New Zealand and elsewhere telling the stories of his life. It was a pretty amazing. That's extraordinary. That's why it seems so amazing that it's so forgotten. I mean, what drives you in this kind of time of like fake news and forgotten stories to actually tell stories like this? Um, it was Dakari versus the King was another that had a lot of elements of forgotten history. What is it that drives you? Well, I mean, we just saw recently, 2017, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, you know, that whole idea of truth-telling in history, which is still so problematic in our country. You know, we still can't really properly, properly as we saw with the dismissal of that whole mm. incredible, beautiful movement from, from Uluru. Um, we can't acknowledge our history. So I still find it... And when you tell people from overseas too, you know, that, that it's... I just find it really, really uh, incredible in this day and age that we still struggle so much to tell the true stories of this this country. So that's one thing. And and also, in kind of unpacking that and, and spending a lot of time in Aboriginal communities, just what, uh, uh, you know, amazing cultures we have in this country and how lucky we are to have them, you know. So, you know, it came through in this film, it came through in Ducky Owens the King 20 years ago. Um, just the, the rich... Um, incredible um, connection that people have had with country for you know eighty thousand years. It's just what a treasure we have in this country. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I do find it extraordinary, and I think that comes across so well in your film that the richness of that history and the connections and the things that are forgotten, and then the, the things that are found now through your stories. Mm. Uh, and so this was ten years in the making. Have you yep. already started on another one? I do hope we don't have to wait another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's quite a few projects that I'm looking forward to doing. Um, and there's one that I, I'm really looking forward to do. I've been, you know, Ducky Office the King, you, you mentioned that film, which was nearly 20 years ago. That film... Uh, finishes on the Drobitchvi River, and um, this film with that smoking ceremony finishes on the Drobitchvi River. So it feels like, you know, I've, I've come a long way to not go very far. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and the, the next film, um, I'm interested in the sailing journeys that uh, that Yongo people did, the people of Northeast Arnhem Land, going to Indonesia for centuries. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, again, a little-known history in this country that... Uh, Aboriginal people were tourists in Southeast Asia before in pre-colonial times. Like how many people know that story? That sounds like a fascinating one. I hope it's not, not 10 years. Um, and uh, just a little about your plans for the film, your plans for the skin of others. Um, hopefully a lot of people will have seen it online, but uh, you do you have other plans for it too? Yeah, it would be, I mean... As I'm sure lots of filmmakers have been talking with you, Jenny, it's a really funny time to be releasing a film right now. <laughs> uh, I mean, I had high hopes that the film could travel around the world into to some of the festivals that uh, I've been to in previous times and we can um, tell this story because it's an international story as you get from the, the text of the film, but also the ideas, the ideas about um, understanding the, the trials of of and accepting others, as we're seeing you know, big struggles in the US at the moment, um, injustice and, and so on. Like these, these are very international ideas in a kind of post-colonial world. Um, so I was hoping the film can tra travel overseas and a little bit, and then I'd love to, to bring it back and have a, uh, uh, a kind of uh, a small cinema run. Um, uh, Ronan is the distributor here in Australia, so we'd love to kind of put on some screenings here and. Um, 
showcase it a little bit more here in this country. That's the plan. Well, we run a travelling film festival, I'm not sure if you know, that goes to Queensland, New South Wales and Northern Territory, um, and we'd love to take it to Catherine. Um, we had uh, Bang Tommy Lewis in Catherine with a short film uh, only a few years ago, um, a Connection to Country, and he was a wonderful guest. He's obviously, his family's from that area, so that would be great to take it there. Uh, I'm sure that would be quite a, an emotional experience for people up in Catherine to see him again. I know that uh, that Fleur Parry, Belling's uh, uh, widow, was telling me that when she watched the film, um, the dogs went crazy. That uh, you know, hearing the voice of Belling after all this time, that was really quite a you know an experience for for her family. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your film, and good luck in the competition. And uh, Thank you for giving so many, it's such an insightful film. And as you talk, you can see there's so many echoes of things that are going on in our world at the moment and things we should take note of. So thank you. Great. Could I just say a couple of thank yous that may or may not go into to this? Because uh, um, it's funny when you have to do the three minute introduction to the film. <laughs> You know, there's people you forget, and I'd I'd love to I'd love to thank uh, Catherine Millis, who is the cinematographer on this film, along with Alan Collins, who did an amazing job, and and we shot uh, all those sequences with Balang Lewis in the studio where he was meeting Henry Lawson and so on. So uh, Catherine did a really really fantastic job, and a, a big uh, shout out to all of the uh, amazing animators that worked on this film uh, as well. They did a, a great job, I think, and I'm really really proud of. Uh, how they all pulled it together. So I'd like to thank them too. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jenny.